hi, everybody. We'll just give a minute or two for people to log in and then we will start very shortly. Thank you. All right, good day everyone and welcome. I'm delighted to see so many of you joining us online across countries and time zones for the latest webinar of the Thinking Working Politically Community of Practice Global Series, which promises to be a fascinating discussion on thinking working politically about regional cooperation and integration. My name is Alina Rocha Menocal and I am the director of the TWP Community of Practice hosted at the University of Birmingham. Well, I have also been a senior researcher in politics and governance at ODI, a leading uh, think tank in global, on global affairs for many years. For those, of us, for those of you who may be less familiar with the community of practice, we are a diverse and growing global network of practitioners and researchers in development and global affairs, committed to promoting more effective development policy and practice. Our network includes all sorts of people with extensive experience working in or with the research community, civil society organizations, donor agencies, and implementing partners. Our webinar series seeks to convene conversations that address leading questions and debates related to thinking working politically in collaboration with different partners and with support from the UK, for, the UK Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, FCDO. Please do take a look at our website for more information on past webinars and updates, and make sure you also sign up uh, to our newsletter if you haven't already. I will turn over the webinar very shortly to our chair, Kathleen Van Hove, who is a senior policy officer at ECDPM in a moment. But before I do that, I wanted to give a big thank you to both her as well as Bruce Byers in particular for the incredible work that they have done in putting this webinar together today. Bruce, who is head of African Economic Integration at ECDPM, has been a champion of all things TWP for a very long time. And he's also a member of the TWP Community of Practices Steering Committee. So without further ado, without further ado uh, it is my, now my pleasure to turn proceedings over to Kathleen and I very much look forward to the conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Alina. And indeed for me also, it's an honor to present this panel of experienced practitioners in regional integration who will give us a glimpse of the fascinating as well as challenging world of regional integration not from a theoretical point of view, but actually from their vantage point of the reality and their daily reality, um, either within the RECs or as supporting bodies of um, regional integration. I'm not going to give a very long introduction uh, in terms of presenting all of the panelists, but I refer you again to the website of Thinking and Working Politically if you want to know more. But so briefly, let me start with Dr. Rumi Olaywola, who is a um, longstanding researcher and trade economist from the ECOWAS Commission in Abuja. But amongst other things, he's also a faculty member of TRAPCA and a research fellow from AERC. And he has done extensive research on, on issues of regional integration and actually is one of the main authors of um, a large study done by UNECA on the interface between the RECs, free trade agreements and the continental FTA. So warmly recommended. I know it's on the website of Tralak if you want to read more. Um, welcome, Dr. Rumi. Then there's Alain Asimwe, if I pronounce it right. She's the deputy CEO and chief of programs of Trademark East Africa. For those of you who still don't know Trademark East Africa, it's actually a very interesting aid for trade organization funded by a whole host of donors and they support regional integration, of course, and aim to increase trade within East Africa. But she also oversees the climate, climate change and gender portfolios and is the main contact with many of the donors. And I definitely look forward to her interesting insights um, 
that she will share with us in a moment. And then we have um, Maiko Miyake, who is the head of trade facilitation program in West Africa for the World Bank. Um, that's another donor initiative and a setup to support West Africa regional integration. Um, and um, Maiko has a long track record of working on private sector and financial uh, sectors across the world. And finally, um, but not least, my colleague Bruce Byers, who is the head of the African Economic Integration. And he's been doing research on private sector development and the regional organizations, as well as regional economic integration dynamics uh, from a political economy perspective um, in a variety of reasons. And maybe just if I may, Bruce and I both work for ECDPM, the European Centre for Development Policy Management. It's a think and two tank working particularly on Europe Africa relations. It's a non profit, um, a non partisan, sorry, facilitator that works on the interface between policy and practice. Now, before I give the floor um, to the panel and to Bruce to set the scene, just let me briefly also go to the rules of the game of this seminar. First of all, the people who have been invited um, on this distinguished panel were invited for their expertise and they bring the experience from the different angles um, to the same regional integration puzzle, if I may, um, but they are speaking in their own capacity and therefore not representing um, the organization they work for. And secondly, to make it interesting, we're going to have several rounds of questions or a couple of rounds to the panelists to allow them brief answers to the different questions. So I apologize in advance if I'm going to be a bit uh, rude or short and brutal in terms of trying to keep the time, but we want to make sure we have enough room for questions from the floor, which you will not be able to do um, orally, but we ask you to put your questions in the chat function. And my colleague, Purva Karkare, who is also online, will actually help us bundle some of these questions and uh, make sure that we can address them and that the panelists can address those. And then we'll finish with a final round um, of takeaways. And I'm already quite sure that this one and a half hour discussion will be very rich and way too rich for one and a half hours. So hopefully this is the start of a series of more dialogues. But so without further ado, let me give the floor to Bruce um, for 10 minutes to actually set the scene and share um, your thoughts and analysis with us. Okay, thank you very much, Kathleen, and, and thanks everybody for, for joining today. Um, I guess I'm just gonna, what I'm gonna do is try and a little bit explain where we felt the need for this meeting came from or for this webinar comes from. Uh, so go a little bit through sort of the motivation about why we've been working on this topic of regional integration and trying to bring thinking working politically to it, a bit of what we've been doing and, and sort of hopefully some examples and where we could go with that sort of thinking ahead. And I think like, like many good things, maybe the motivation for all this uh, actually comes something from a frustration um, and a frustration from multiple sides, I think, within discussions we were having within Africa at the regional level, that sense of frustration at commitments being made for regional trade agreements, for regional cooperation in general, which were then not being respected when it came to implementation. So challenges in terms of implementation of these regional agreements. And then frustrations also from the donors that we interact with who are trying to support these, these processes, but sort of struggling with why are we sort of supporting these things when in fact what we see perhaps isn't really the, 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 the political will is not there. And what we're trying to do is kind of dig into this story of political will really, and try and say, okay, what is behind political will? Can we rather actually talk about interests and incentives, how are relations, and then how do those fit in to this sort of dynamic of, of regional integration? So in a way we've been sort of borrowing a bunch of methodologies that have been being used more in the sort of the realm of governance, uh, although increasingly applied to other areas within the sort of development community and trying to bring this to regional cooperation. Now, of course, regional cooperation covers many things. So it can be about peace and security cooperation, climate adaptation, energy, uh, where we've been focusing. I mean, we have covered those, but our main focus today is actually more on sort of economic integration and trade. 
to give us at least some sort of limits to what we're talking about, but hopefully some of the things uh, that we're going to talk about also so spread over. So what we've been really looking at is trying to understand these interests and incentives around regional organizations, of which there are many in Africa, regional corridors, which in a way is kind of sort of the bottom up through the, 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 the transport corridors through which trade and economic exchange is taking place, and then wider issues of trade and industrialization. And I guess sort of the point that, 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 the, that the challenge really is that in fact, you're adding an additional layer of politics so when you talk about policy implementation at the national level, of course, there are, there are, there are sort of policy ambitions and then the internal politics struggle, political struggles really to see what actually happens in practice. And here, when we add on the regional layer, we're basically saying there are sort of political challenges between countries then, which play out to a degree through the regional organizations, but not only, which then interact with these politics which are taking place within the countries. And I, th I mean, the, I think the, the, the conclusion from some of our work, and then I'll just go into some of the more specific findings, is that in a way the challenge is not that regional integration is not happening, but the challenge is more that it's happening in ways that make it difficult for conventional policies to address and for con con conventional uh, support mechanisms to, to, to work with. So a way the challenge, and that's a bit, I think, hopefully what we could discuss today, is how to bring this sort of a better understanding of these politics between and within countries and apply it to uh, sort of policy making and then policy implementation and policy support. So the kind of things that we've been looking at, um, as I say, are, are often to do with sort of trade corridors. And just to give an example of sort of some of the kinds of findings we have, one is, for example, that efficiency objectives, which are often sort of what are sought, uh, and, and I'm sure Alan and, and, and Michael will talk about, it's about bringing down trade costs, bringing down trade times. And while that seems to be sort of an agenda which everybody should buy into, when you look, and we did work around the Abidjan Wagadougou corridor, for example, you discover that in fact, there are many actually quite powerful actors, whether they're political or economic, whether it's sort of groups of individuals, whether it's truck drivers, or those just sort of managing to make a livelihood around ports, who in fact wouldn't benefit from bringing down these trade and transport costs. They're, they're, so the, the, the status quo does benefit some. And in a way, what we've been trying to do is saying, if we can understand better who those actors are and where their interests are, then hopefully that can help us also sort of um, think of, of, of policies and support programs which take that context more into reality. Another thing I think is often, which follows from that of course, is that there's, there's a, a need for policymakers to focus on policy, which ultimately means thinking in terms of formal agreements, but then struggling with how that lands on the ground. So in a way it's just bringing us back to the same issue, but even Sort of the Kagame report, which was done in 2016 with Paul Kagame looking at the African Union, there was sort of some self recognition really about the struggle to move from these formal agreements to implementation. So, and the challenge really is that we have big agreements still emerging. So, now at the moment, the, the continental free trade area is sort of the big thing in, in Africa in terms of trying to make links basically between all these regional free trade agreements, which themselves have their own hurdles. Uh, and linking these together in a continental one. And there's huge political momentum behind this in terms of the number of political leaders signing up. But the risk is that, again, signing formal agreements is almost the easy part. It's not to say that it is easy with 50, 54 or 55 countries, 54 that have managed to, that, that have agreed to the, the, the agreement. But then to actually get that to move beyond the agreement and beyond ratification into implementation, is again where there are likely to be challenges, precisely because at a national level, there are industrialization sort of interests and, and objectives, job creation, job protection. And then what I mentioned about in the corridors that are other actors who themselves prefer the status quo, whether it's the small scale people uh, making livelihoods because there are barriers or whether it's to do with sort of state business relations and, and, and influence. So, I mean, to kind of zoom out from that then and a bit bring us back to the discussion today, as ECDPM, we have been doing studies on this kind of work. So we're, we're here in a seminar which is to do with thinking and working politically. So we've been doing a lot of the thinking part in a way. We've been doing sort of the analysis and our sort of theory of change, if you like, is that by being more explicit about sort of where these interests are, that this can somehow help 
sort of undo some of the implementation blockages. So the struggle though is how to get from this thinking into genuinely working. So we are as a think tank, obviously not an implementation body, but we are trying to sort of see how we can also engage with the regional bodies and with the, with the donors supporting them to see how we could actually help move forward. Now the agenda in sort of the wider development world, let's say, and, and this within this thinking working politically, it's about the need to be problem driven, the need to be flexible and adaptive, uh, the need to take complexity into account. Uh, there's sort of recent work, as many will have seen about gambling on development, there's a sense of taking small risks. And a bit the question is, is, is this a kind of a, a donor sort of concern and question and are donors managing to actually take it into account and how do they take it into account? And also from the from the, the African side and looking at someone who's sitting in a regional economic community, one of the RECs, is this all an external conversation? In fact, we're all trying to sort of articulate these interests, but in fact, these are just playing out in practice is on the ground and this is almost sort of unhelpful. So that's a bit sort of what I want, for me at least, that's that's sort of the, the motivation to, 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 to have this meeting. And I guess one of the sort of the, maybe as a small provocation then to, to our panelists who are, who are going to follow um, is that I think there is a, a genuine sort of understanding of, yes, implementation is sometimes a struggle. There's a bit of the shortcut saying it's about political will. So, but can we go beyond that? But the other sort of question is how much of a need to have is political economy analysis? And, and how much is it really just a nice to have? Um, and that's because that's a bit the sort of the space I think that we find ourselves in here. So very interested in the topics and in the analysis and trying to unpick these things, but then how to sort of get this into the actual sort of action that takes place through the regional bodies and, 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 and the support programs. So that's a bit sort of where we're coming from. And then I'm, I'm very intrigued to hear where, what, where the panelists uh, will come in on this and, and the conversation. Thanks. Thank you, Bruce, and thank you for sticking to uh, to the time. Um, and indeed, I think that's very much the scene. And um, you formulated the questions uh, already quite well. So, political economy tries to go behind the normative approach to regional integration and the political declarations. Um, we do that analysis and try to understand and give it. Indeed, gives quite a different picture, as you explained. Uh, to show a little bit where the resistances are. Um, actually, I think what you explained is certainly not just linked to regional integration in Africa, but it's regional integration in general. I mean, this uh, very much applies. But may I maybe start with Dr. Wumi? Um, you work within one of these regional economic communities in ECOWAS. And so many of those things, the politics of regional integration are a daily reality for you. So what Bruce presented is, does that actually resonate with you? And do you find some of that analysis at all useful in one way or the other? That's his question. And indeed, can that influence some of the programming of your, of your organization? I um, give the floor to you and you have about five minutes if you want to share some of your perspectives here. Okay, <clears throat> Kathleen, thank you very much. I thank you for giving me this kind of opportunity, but uh, let me state clearly here, every of my discussion today is my own personal view and doesn't represent the standpoint uh, of where I work at Coas Commission. I just want to share some experience from my extensive research work in this area. And I think uh, Bruce has laid solid foundation. But in order for us to understand the political economic uh, context of this issue of uh, regional integration, I would like to pose another question that apart from big gap between the adoption and implementation of regional agreement provisions, uh, expansionated by Bruce, uh, we can also probe further to see why the gap is wider in some of regional integration provision compared to other. And this one can provide some kind of justification to the relevance of the political economic analysis 
of dealing with the issue of regional integration. And let me put this one in the proper perspective. I want to state four major factors. One, if government take the center stage in the design and the governance of various regional integration arrangements, and we believe that government businesses are done by and with politics, and if regional integration involve seeding of sovereignty and policy locking, then definitely political economic analysis is very, very relevant when dealing with issue of regional integration. Is some politics can never be taken for granted. And I want us to look at political consideration from three major factors. One is the issue of peace and security. Second one is the political and civic commitment. And the third one is mutual trust. And for me to be able to do that, let me now try to now be specific, especially with regional integration in Africa. I would like to categorize countries participating in various regional economic communities into three. One is the first category I call optimistic countries. What are the characteristics of these countries? One, they are open to reforms. They are always ready to take advantage. And third, they are willing to implement. So the willingness is very, very high. Those countries can be regarded as optimistic country. The second category is what I call pessimistic countries. These countries are somehow partial or close economy. They are very careful in taking advantage of any kind of reforms and always focus more on disadvantages of any kind of agreement and very low willingness to implement. And the third one is what I can call neutral countries. These neutral countries let me, is what we call follow follow countries or keep up with Joneses. They don't have any position, depending on the position of who they want to support between the optimistic and the pessimistic country. When you have these three categories of countries, definitely, it will show the heterogeneity nature of various countries participating in regional integration. And when you have this kind of thing, you will now be able to see that a lot of politics will be involved. But this position to complicate matters for Bruce is that this position of those countries are very dynamic. A pessimistic country today can be an optimistic country tomorrow. A neutral country today may be a pessimistic country tomorrow. Also, depending on which area of integration you are talking about, you will form whether a country will be a pessimistic one or an optimistic one. Did we lose you, doctor? OK. Um... Three. We okay. Yes. We we had lost you very briefly, but actually we're already almost at the five minutes. So um, okay. No 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 and, no. But yeah, make uh, your uh, finalize your okay, point good. and then. And the third one is the issue of the private sector influence and also the external influence and mutual on trust. And because of this, we can be able to see that this combination of all these factors will determine which position a country will a country, the country will be in participating in regional integration. So whether the adopt, that's why we see some country, they were eager to adopt, but not willing to implement. And that is why I will now conclude by saying, the politics of negotiation is different from policy of signing. And the policy of signing is different from policy of implementation. If I have another opportunity, I will now come to help us in order to use some strategic as a, example in order to portray some of my standpoint. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Umi. Yes, uh, surely in our second round, I will come specifically to those uh, ECOWAS examples. So thank you very much.
very interesting categorization. Um, I maybe go straight into um, asking Alain, who, I mean, obviously, I mean, to me, as far as I understood, Tanzania could have been categorized in one and with a new president can keep, be categorized in another from what I uh, hear. Um, but so you as TMEA, not you, sorry, TMEA, is, um, is quite a unique setup with hubs and spokes and multi-year funding and multi-donor and so on. So from what we see as an outsider, seem to have quite a lot of flexibility and freedom to decide what kind of um, things you would support and where and how and how long. And of course, always how it contributes to regional trade. But the political economy analysis that um, Bruce was talking about, does this help you in any way? That, has that helped you in defining your programming of your, of your uh, pro programs? Thanks so much, Kathleen, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, as Bruce spoke, I mean, it brought back a decade of plus of uh, work we have done in the region. And so many, <laughs> I was smiling quite a bit at so many examples. When you ask the question, I'll just go straight to the point. Of course, that analysis helps. We as Trademark come in thinking, came in thinking we are very much a technical body. Our role is to really support the, in, the region to integrate and to do trade more. But at times, I think that can be naive thinking because as uh, Dr. Omi has said, there are so many layers. And so in the earlier years, I remember what we did is we, did, we relied, relied quite a bit on uh, studies that had been done, political economy studies, but this could potentially backfire. There were cases where we relied on donor studies that had been say done on the infrastructure sector or done on one of the key core sectors that were working with the trade sector. And when these studies would fall into the hands of say the, part, the people you're trying to build partnerships with, immediately you come in from a place of mistrust. Immediately you come in from a place where people are looking at you suspiciously because they're wondering, why are you writing this stuff about us? <laughs> what are you thinking? So we've had to learn right from the start that the best way to do this was to earn the trust. And so over the last decades, we've had to earn the trust by just listening. We, we pride ourselves on saying we are demand driven, but of course we quickly learned that at times it's who's demand, who is demanding this, who is demanding this road, who is demanding this border post, who is demanding this bridge? Is it really the need of the trade community and the people? or is it the need of this official? Is it going to help this official in the next election in terms of delivering on a promise they have made? Or is it going to, uh, to, to actually make a difference in the lives of the communities and the trade? So often at times where there's a convergence, then you're okay. Between all those demands and needs, then you're okay. But when there's a this convergence and you're not able to find out the reality and the realism, you must find a way to get to the root of things. So whether it be a big political economy study, which I'm not so much for, or it's really an on the ground kind of understanding of the issues, the nuances, you have to decide. When we go into certain areas, you will often get the first, I mean, if you went to talk to customs officials, the first thing they will tell you, oh, we have to do supervision or we have to do inspection because there are so many risks or there's a lot of uh, uh, what's going on. There's a lot of smuggling. But when you dig deep, you realize that perhaps it's not the issue. But if you take it at face value and you design a program, for instance, to stop, let's say a program on scanners, you will actually find that the scanners remain unused for 10 years. <laughs> we have seen cases of brand new scanners, not ours, but for certain programs that are installed and never used, never switched on. And so you ask yourself, was this the problem? Was this the actual issue that we're trying to... to... So we, we've had to learn to go under the issue. And what is said at face value is, a, is often not the issue. You have to go deep, but getting that information requires days, months, years of building trust, of really building relations, of getting people to respect you enough to say, Alan, I'll trust you with this information. This is the real reason why this isn't working. So we've had to learn that, and the last 10, 12 years of our work have shown that if you take this practical approach, you may rely on the studies because the studies do give you the broader in picture and, and all that, but we ourselves have to be with our ears on the ground. We have to really understand the nuances. And that is something I think I've learned even as we try to expand to West Africa. What is told to you at face value often isn't the case. 
for instance, if they are to tell you why there are challenges between say, trade between Benin and Nigeria, you will take it at face value and create immediately a program that is going to look at, say, tracking cargo along the corridor. But that's not the problem. That may not be the first problem that you need to deal with. The problem may be deeper. So that has been one of the key lessons. So if I were to answer you, yes, the studies help, but you need more than the studies. You need to build trust. You need to build relations. You need to have your ear on the ground. There are so many things where we have caught, been caught by surprise. Again, programs evolve. We go in thinking we know it. And before you know it, uh, things are different. We have had to learn that contexts also are different. We did a very successful program at the port of Mombasa in terms of greening the port, in terms of port efficiency and productivity. We tried to replicate this at the port of Dar es Salaam, but as you said, maybe the timing then wasn't right. Maybe at that time, it wasn't the moment to do it. Would a political economy study have shown us? Perhaps it would have said, look, the dynamics right now in Tanzania don't allow for such uh, a big program. But you could come in small and you know, talk to one or two people, do this and that, and then wait later and do a big reform program uh, in, in the country. So yeah, I hope I've responded to your question. For me, what I take away from the work we've done in the last decade is that just building the relationships adds another layer that you would never get from the political economy studies. But you do need the studies to provide the framework, provide the broad issues and, 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 and some pointers. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Helen. Indeed, not taking things at face value, going digging deeper and listening and building trust, I think, are the main, uh, main. And it's interesting to say that, indeed, sometimes PEA studies actually did not help with that building trust and undermined it. So we have to be careful with some of that, some of that work. Um, very interesting. Michael, I, may I turn to you? I mean, the World Bank is working in West Africa with a similar objective as Trademark East Africa, but with quite a different structure. And from the outset, it maybe sounds more complex because it also includes the regional economic communities and several donors and so on. But at the same time, maybe, I mean, it's certainly not in parallel, which then other people sometimes argue um, TMEA might be seen as. So do you feel like political economy, um, do you have the space to use political economy studies to adapt your support? Because that was a word Alain also used quite often, that flexibility and adapting. And with the more players you're in the game, the more difficult it is, I guess, to, to be so flexible. So over to you. Thank you, Kathleen, and good morning to all the participants and uh, um, the people who are listening to this uh, this webinar. Um, perhaps it um, it is worth just explaining a little bit uh, what we mean by complex, <laughs> uh, so that the audience who don't know about the TFWA understand where we are coming from. So the Trade Facilitation of West Africa is a program financed by four donors, uh, financial technical partners. They are European Union, the Netherlands, GMZ, GMZ from Germany and USAID. Uh, but it, it is not the typical structure of uh, pooling a fund in one trust fund. So it is not a single trust fund. And the fund is managed by two implementing partners. Um, one is the World Bank Group, which I represent today, um, although I am talking on my personal um, capacity. And then uh, we partner with another implementing partner, which is GIZ from Germany. And each organization manages the portion of the fund placed by the four donors I mentioned uh, earlier. Right. The program is overseen by a steering committee, we meet, which meets once a year to review the work program, and then let the implementing partners, uh, GIZ and the World Bank Group, to do the implementation uh, and take the implementation decisions. The committee is consisted of the, the four donors I mentioned, together with ECOWAS and WEMOA, the two regional uh, organizations and uh, the chaired by the ECOWAS. Right? So operationally, then the two implementing partners uh, work with all the entities relevant to the agenda of regional integration. So uh, obviously the regional economic communities, but also the national governments for implementation of the regional instruments, but then also private sector and the civil society. 
Uh, and of course, in order to make sure the implementing partners are implementing in a coherent fashion, the coordination between GIZ and the World Bank Group is a critical. So uh, yes, Catherine, you said it is a complex structure. Yes, absolutely. Um, mind bogglingly uh, complex. But I, I think that current structure of TFWA is precisely the result of the political economy analysis that has been conducted by the donors before they approached the World Bank Group and the GIZ to be the implementing partners. And what do I mean by that? So the first and foremost, the, 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 the four donors recognize that there is a fragmentation of the dialogue in the region created by themselves for the lack of coordination among themselves. So that recognition led to the agreement to work together. And then I do commend the, the initiative of these donors because in order to make this happen, each of them had to let go something. Right? It, uh, they have their own internal procedures which need to be bent uh, in order to allow for such a cooperation. Then the donors uh, also tackled several challenges, uh, the political economy, uh, some of which uh, mentioned by Bruce. So the second point here is um, the leveraging the existing institutional infrastructure, recognizing that there are so many players already in the, uh, you know, in, in the play, right? And they take advantage of the institutional memory, knowing that the, it is a very complex landscape. So the, the both World Bank Group and the GIZ have been seen as organizations who have been working in the region for a long time and established the stakeholder engagement and um, TFWA could take advantage of the experience. Um, in fact, the strong existing footprints on the ground allow the project to be launched fairly quickly using the engagement already existing. And then I would also say that the maturity of the, the existence and the relationship was critical during the, during the time of COVID to ensure that we could continue the dialogue despite the difficulty in seeing each other. The third point I would raise is that the program also needed to address the challenge uh, raised by the political economy analysis, that tension of uh, um, trying to address the notion of think regionally, but act locally. Right? Yeah, that, that was another point that the Bruce was mentioning earlier. The existing interventions tend to be either too regionally focused and no implementation on the ground or focused on national implementation too much and lost the sight of the regional picture. So this is why uh, the donors asked the two implementing partners who have a track record in either one of them to work together to leverage each other. So the GIZ with a strong track record in working with ECOWAS uh, and then the World Bank Group, uh, who has an extensive experience in uh, making a country level implementation happen. Um, so then, then finally, to facilitate the coordination between ECOWAS and WEMOA, which is also another point often raised by the political economy analysis, um, those two organizations have been asked to join the, the steering committee and then use the steering committee as a platform for the regional dialogue. So, um, Catherine, to answer your question, uh, yes, uh, PEA is almost like a must item in putting together a program. Um, is the outcome a burden? Perhaps so, but I would say, that, you know, the it is the result of the, 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 the complex challenge that we are facing. So if one tries to address the issues raised by the PEA, this is a price to pay for having a program that walks the talk of the recommendations of the PEA. I'll stop here. Thank you very much, Michael. Indeed, interesting to, uh, we all know, even at the country level is complex, but the PEA at regional level is even more complex. And then saying indeed, therefore, that political economy of the complexity led to a process but led to a setting up of something complex but inclusive and and bringing the different partners around the table the thinking regionally and acting locally is another one of those those the 
challenges, I think. And I, there, the hubs and spokes setup, of course, of TMEA, actually, I think is also an, an interesting uh, an interesting answer to some of those questions. Um, and But the point with, that you made about leveraging existing instruments, I think, is also quite an interesting one. Um, I think, Bruce, I'm not going to give you the floor right quite yet, but uh, I'm very keen to, to hear a bit further now um, in the second round and give indeed uh, Dr. Wumi the, the floor to give some of the examples that you said where indeed you had some concrete experience with potentially using some of political momentum that was created or um, finding ways to overcome some of the blockages or, or what you did when a positive, an optimistic country changed into a pessimistic or, or also happy to hear the examples you want to bring us. And indeed, very much in your own capacity, not as an ECOWAS representative. Okay. Thank you very much. I think I have five minutes more, but I will be specific. But for me to put my contribution proper perspective, there's, we need to really recognize ECOWAS as a tripartite arrangement comprising three major regional integration arrangements. We have the ECOWAS, we have the IMUA, and we have the Mano River Union. Three of them coexist. But ECOWAS as a dominant partner of Nigeria, IMUA as Côte d'Ivoire, and Mano River Union may be somehow neutral. But as we know, ECOWAS is a wider regional integration arrangement. Why IMUA is a deeper regional integration arrangement, and Manu River Union is just like a cultural regional integration. The three of them coexist. You ask me the question, how? First thing I want you to know is that as part of the management of the regional integration arrangement, ECOWAS recognized the supremacy of member states and bottom-up approach. That's why we look at the ECOWAS Treaty, Article 3A and Article 3K of a Revised Treaty of 1993. Is any kind of regional arrangement must harmonize and coordinate the national policies. And also, there must be evil development within the region. That's the first thing, giving it a legal backing so that there can be a bit some kind of coexistence among uh, countries, that's number one. Number two is that ECOWAS prioritize peace and security and governance. So the fact is a standing rule, that is will be number one priority in the region. So you see the relevance of political economic analysis, issue of peace and security and governance is politics. So that's why, we, that's number two. Number three is the equal representation and presence. In all ECOWAS member states, there's a presence of ECOWAS institution. Anywhere there's no ECOWAS institution, there will be re resident representative. And if you look at man management structure, each country is duly represented. So there's no element of exclusion. And number, the last one that I just want because of my time is the, what Michael said the other time the operation of uh, interinstitutional collaboration and joint technical secretariat is between among uh, ECOWAS, IMOA, and, uh, and the Manu River Union. So if you look at ECOWAS West African EPA negotiation, it was done along that line. So there are many regional agreements, you know, it's done in terms of that kind of institutional uh, arrangement. And lastly, is that there's a due recognition of the private sector as a partner. So in any kind of regional integration arrangement you want to make, whether negotiation or harmonization, private sector must make a contribution. But what I'm saying in essence is that those are those things that ECOWAS try as much as possible to put in order to be able to address those kind of political economic challenges. But in essence, have we been able to solve the problem? I will say no. If you see 
if you have the time to look at the politics of negotiation of West Africa EPA negotiate economic partnership agreement, you will see the challenges. If you see the, the challenge, maybe in some of the country reluctancy to sign African continental free trade area, you will be able to appreciate what I'm saying. And also you'll be able to see the big gap between signing and ratification, especially in the example of the AFCFTA. That's another example that I can be able to. But I would like to pose a question and you'll be able to appreciate what I'm discussing. ECOWAS as a region embraced free movement of persons and the union is rated as number one. How many countries of ECOWAS have signed free protocol protocol of AFCFTA? So you'll be able to see the issue of political economy is challenging. So it is that we need to now look to probe further to be able to do that. And that's what I'm able to say. But let me throw a note of caution. When we are dealing, especially Bruce, when you are addressing the issue of political economic analysis, first thing I would like you to know is that one, not all political economic analysis can be done by external consultant. Some of them need to be done internally. Not all these research output are for public consumptions. That's number two. Number three is uh, these political analyses are very cumbersome. The what we call the more you look, the less you see. So I would like you just to take a clue from the operation of the Economic Research Institute of ASEAN and East Africa area in terms of their operation. You see the way they manage resources among the politicians, the country, and the member states. Classify researches, and they can be able to use it to influence policy. And that's what I'll be able to see because that's the challenges of many of the external donors. Some of them, <laughs> they need to understand one major factors. The pe many pessimistic countries are the dominant countries in any regional integration arrangement. They are the one that we can classify as large country because they have a lot of influence. But the external donors tend to, maybe let me put it this way, like to support the optimistic country at the expense of the pessimistic country. But it is the optimistic country that holds this way in terms of the implementation. So what we need to focus on to be able to see how do we try as much as possible to carry all those countries on board and be able to be able to specify and understand the issue that we want to address. And as I said earlier on, the politics of uh, negotiation is different from policy of implementation. And I will let you to understand this. And let me conclude by throwing some light on the implementation of FYCET. All countries adopted the policy and we started the implementation in 2015. But how did Nigeria implement this policy? By using its political position to hide three main documents, the import adjustment tax, the import prohibition, eh? and also uh, the import prohibition list, and, and three, the other documents. And they use this kind of document to manipulate the system in such a way that, first of all, with what Bruce said the other time, in order to continue to protect the industrial sector. And you will see a big conflict between Nigeria industrial policy and the regional arrangement. And for the country to be able to do that, you can be able to see that instead of the Equal CET to be trade facilitative, you can now see the protection rate in the country mm -hmm. very higher compared to others. And that's what I just want to share you. But when we are talking about political economic analysis, let us be focused and understand the context that we want to address. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Rumi, indeed. So same message actually as Alan saying, look, behind. don't take things at face value. Um, you had quite a few interesting points, I think, that you made also in terms of often the larger ones are the pessimistic, but donors come with an agenda and want to support regional integration and sort of hold on to the positive ones. 
and then sometimes are surprised that things don't go exactly the way they hoped. Um, is that a similar experience you have, Alan? Sorry, I'm dealing with the politics of the microphones. So <laughs> now, I mean, this is a really interesting, and it, it just gets me thinking. The last year with the onset of the AFCFTA, if we thought we had a complex situation, it's actually become more complex because as we as you spoke earlier, at Trademark, we've been priding ourselves on working at the national level and with the REC. So we do have a number of MOUs with RECs. But now you have national level, then you have the REC, then you have the continental. Yes, you had the AU commission. It had a clear political mandate and all. But now you have the FFCFTA secretary, which is trying to establish itself get itself on the map, get itself set up. And so you have this dynamic of trying to sort of, it's a delicate dance, trying to work at the national, at the regional and the continental. I don't think we have it yet. We are just trying to see how do you balance the various interests? How do you balance the interests even within the regs trying to determine this is my space, this is where I'm working. So if it's ECOWAS, should the FCFTA come into that space? Or should it work in Tarek? These are questions that are going on around different groups. You as an implementer are caught in between this delicate dance, this delicate uh, complex situation. And you're trying to do a delicate dance to try and see how you can support. And then you have this dynamic of the corridors. We have worked for decade, over a decade along key corridors, key transport corridors. Often the corridors are within a wreck, but at times they may overstep and get into another wreck. So now just trying to see how you program across these corridors becomes a challenge. And that brings in then the donors. The donors, of course, with a fixed either agenda, either they will have key countries, their own national politics, say if it's in Brussels, Belgium, they'll have their key priorities. They'll say we'll only work in one, two, three, four countries. Then there's the Anglophone dynamics. We'll only work in the Francophone countries or we'll only work in the Anglophone countries. So you really have a dynamic that you're trying to balance at all times, and it may not be possible to do so effectively. So you end up getting caught. Yet you're priding yourself on being a technical partner that is apolitical. But of course, we have to play the politics. We have to understand and play the politics. One of the things we've talked about earlier is programming has to be adaptive. It has to be flexible. Often donor programming is not in the earlier years, it was. We were allowed to innovate, to think, but now it's very much earmarked and fixed. And I think Michael may also face the same challenge. A lot of the funding comes in. It is sort of really earmarked either to a country or to a specific region. And yet, if you're saying we're going to support intra-African trade, you want to be able to have funding that allows you to spread and to test the boundaries and to stretch and to work across RECs and to work within RECs. All those are some of the dynamics uh, we, 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 we are facing. Is there adequate data to support us beyond the PEA studies? That has been a challenge. As we try to extend, for instance, West Africa, you find you're actually in, I would call a data jungle. You're trying to dig deep and try to understand, and there's not much that you can find that you're going to be able to use. So you're trying to create then new data or new scenarios or new contexts that are going to help you to, to plan and program. But remember, the funding is not contextualized in that sense. The funding doesn't follow that. The funding is very specific. It's very rigid. So it's really a tough one that we are facing. Let me look at some specific, uh, we've talked about a lot about the private sector, but we haven't brought them in. Let me talk about some specific sectors that we've really been challenged with. For instance, in terms of the logistics industry, on the terms of the tracking. As we design uh, solutions that help across borders, for instance, the regional electric cargo tracking that is supposed to help, you know, move goods across or uh, sorry that's supposed to track and ensure trust and transparency across corridors across borders you find that you not you don't have all these stakeholders on board because as bruce said some have been benefiting from an inefficient system i mean if your trucks are going to spend four weeks on the road that you're earning more from the client maybe or maybe there are other reasons why you you don't mind if it's not moving as fast. Of course, the end user is going to hit, get hit with these costs. But the end user doesn't know any better. If I buy this shirt, I often don't know that three quarters of the price has come from delays along the corridor. I could have bought it at a quarter of the price, but I don't know that. I don't know any better. So where is, who is going to determine and control this? It's going to be maybe the logistics sector. So how do you deal with them? How do you shift the incentives for them to accept these corridor programs? to accept to, uh, uh, to, to, to let things move across corridors. Then there's something else that I had wanted to talk about that Bruce brought in, the political challenges between countries, the state differences where we are often caught in between. 
Right now you can see the tension between DRC, Uganda, Rwanda, and yet just a few weeks ago, there was so much excitement around the entry of the DRC into the East African community. We were all super excited. As trademark, we have supported the construction of border crossings across the whole breadth of Uganda and DRC. I think there are two or three crossings there. You go down to Rwanda, we've supported there. And we're also looking at Burundi and, 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 and DRC. So there's excitement in that there's opportunities. Just imagine having that population, having that market, having that space, having the whole uh, economy of DRC really coming into power, not just Eastern Africa, but Africa as well. However, now there are tensions. So what happens with our programming? How do you reconcile and deal with these issues? So these are some of the, at times you get caught up within these state differences. At times our technical solutions are not enough to address the bigger political challenge that is faced in this sense. And so we are struggling with how do we deal with these uh, uh, bigger issues and make sure that our, our perhaps our, our, our solutions could provide an avenue for peace, for reconciliation, for people to talk and see that they can overcome uh, these uh, state differences. Let me stop there and uh, yeah, I'll wait to hear from the rest. Thank you very much, Alan. Indeed, interesting to make the link also with the peace and security. And uh, I'm imagining this delicate dance, putting more and more in a corset and, and having less and less space to indeed do that flexible kind of an adaptive work. Um, and the, can imagine the challenges also indeed with DRC and how, how that's uh, coming. So plenty of more room for many more <laughs> dialogues, I think. Um, but maybe, Michael, I come to you. Does any of this resonate with you? Do you have maybe examples of where, I mean, I think you started off already saying we built our setup on the basis of some of the dialogue and political economy, but do you have any particular experience of where you said, well, here we actually managed to move forward or to use a momentum or to actually unblock something? Thank you. Yes, yeah, so I, I was thinking of the example. Um, I will share something, but before that, uh, um, I just wanted to say I completely share uh, the observations and views of Alan and Dr. Wumi. Um, Alan, the way that you describe the challenges we face on a day-to-day basis, I cannot explain it better. So thank you very much for um, sharing that with, with all the audience here. Um, I, I completely agree with you. Um, and and, 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 and you know, Dr. Wumi was also talking about in earlier, the, it's the optimist countries, the pessimistic countries, and of course they change. And depending on the topics, their position also change. And then all of that, and then knowing, um, you know, like peeling onions and understanding not just the face value, but uh, digging deeper and really understand the position on that specific topic when you are dealing with such a broad range of issues. And all of that really amalgamates to be such a challenge for. For, for us to deal with uh, uh, the implementation of, uh, of the activities. So it is a challenging and um, I'm kind of scratching my head right now what the, you know, the, the interesting and uh, interesting story with some positive, uh, um, you know, the, the positive angle that we can share. So let me share an example of um, uh, the implementation of Sigma. Um, SIGMAT is an acronym for Système de Gestion de Marchandises en Transit. Uh, sorry for my horrible French. It's uh, the system to allow the interconnectivity of customs of uh, ECOWAS member states so that um, all the member states' customs can share the transit information. Um, when the TFWA was in the design and the conception phase, which goes back about five years ago, or even more, uh, there was a proposal already at that time that uh, they wanted to uh, launch Sigma at the regional level to a full-blown uh, implementation. But at that time, uh, actually, the, the skeptical camp won the argument that it didn't um, seem feasible. 
um, there was a there was an overall skepticism on the feasibility of the implementation, but also uh, whether such a system can be effective and uh, you know properly implemented and used in uh, in um, in the in the region. So as a result, the agreement at the time was to uh, test the water through a small pilot but not the committing to the full uh, implementation during the lifetime of the TFWA. However, um, a few years has passed and we are already in the several years down the road on the, on the implementation of the program. Things have changed quite dramatically on this agenda. So uh, the, the ECOWAS, which took the lead in the regional dialogue for the implementation, they actually managed to coalesce quite a number of member states to agree for the implementation. At the same time, some of those member states were so keen that they have started the bilateral conversation between two countries sharing the border. And they even went and negotiated with some donors so that there will be financing behind the implementation of, uh, um, of, the, uh, of the SIGMAT. Um, and then that's where the, the corridor um, that was mentioned by Bruce and Alan that comes in, right? So that it's not the whole, country, the whole region, but the, some of those countries which share the interest, they were willing to move forward within the regional framework that has been, uh, that has been designed. Right? So um, it was an interesting um, um, chance that there was a top-down force, but also the bottom-up force of the member states coming together. So when the, uh, the donors saw and it's an interesting opportunity, they said, well, you know, this is, this is such an opportunity that we shouldn't miss. We should be flexible, we should be adaptive um, to allow the reallocation of funding and reprogramming of resources to support this regional initiative. Right. Uh, luckily, uh, the TFWA had that flexibility built in in the program, so that um, you know we we the implementing partners were given that discretionary power to uh, to do the reallocation as long as the, the at the kind of strategic level steering committee agrees that's a good idea, and then the steering committee all agreed that it was a good idea. So. Um, I think you know, it comes back to the, the theme that the, you laid out to Kathleen earlier. Yes, flexibility, adaptability, being adaptive, that is the name of the game when you are grappling with such a complex uh, you know, political economy to deal with. I'll stop here. Thank you very much, Michael. Indeed, it's a very concrete example and of aligning of different initiatives and momentum and then the adaptability of of the the donors i think that's a it's 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 nice to indeed have concrete examples of where it does manage and i think the issue that comes back also if between corridors and corridor dynamics and the more formal processes and so i think even when we were starting our work no bruce we worked or we saw there's formal regional integration agendas and most of us are economists and have learned the different steps within a regional integration uh, process but stepping away from that not going against it but actually looking at there where there are pockets of interesting regional dynamics with the potential of leading to to benefits and of course there's always winners and losers but where you have an alignment of different interests and then jumping on that occasion, I think creates also a more ownership because the political reality we talk about is indeed also politicians who have to get reelected and have to, and who, if they can, if they have more um, people seeing the benefits of some of this, that because very few politicians actually win elections with regional agendas per se, but if there are specific positive examples that make a difference in day-to-day -day life of a whole group of, of private sector people and, and citizens. I think that's really uh, where we need to, need to go, but we need adaptability. I think this has been two already very fascinating rounds. I see there's already 
two questions, but maybe let me first give the floor. Bruce, do you want to add anything on what has been said? Or oh, I see, Al, I will come in, but I see Alan had, her, had raised her hand, so I'm keen to let Ah, Alan sorry, go. I have the questions in front of me and I didn't see Alan, sorry. Sorry, there's one point that we haven't brought out, the power of individuals to create change. And I thought it would be remiss if we don't. For me, all the 10, 12 years I've worked in region, actually 14 years I've worked on regional integration issues. I've seen the power of individuals actually drive, not even institutions, just identifying what we often call those champions within individuals. Some of our biggest reforms have been carried by individuals. They have the ability to drive, to convince, to engage. So just identifying those, their interests may be altruistic. They just want to do good or they want to get a, maybe a promotion or whatever it is, but their goal is aligning with yours. Their vision is aligning with yours. Those have helped us drive the agenda much more than we could ever have done it. And so just early in the game, pinpointing who these are, working with them, supporting them is key. I also thought it would be remiss if we don't bring out how East Africa managed to drive and push to where it is because of the, what was called then the coalition of the willing. Mm -hmm. Even as we go into, say, West Africa, who are those, what Dr. Womi says, who are those people who want to drive change for whatever reason it is? Who are those political leaders who want to make this thing to work? What is in it for them? Is it the next vote coming up? Is it uh, a, a big win to show that they're leaving a legacy? You know, they are, they are leaving something big for their people to keep referring to them and say, oh, that's the one who did this. If we can find and align with those interests, it helps to push the agenda and also helps to bring people along. I always give the example, until we had the coalition of willing in 20, 2013, I think, we had had so many technical solutions, but until we had the coalition actually step up to bring the political drive to the integration, things were not moving as fast as we would have wanted them. We had thought of border posts, we had thought of ICT solutions, we were doing standards, but it's only when the presidents came together and said, we must do this. And they met every three, every two months and they had an agenda. They introduced the single tourist visa. They introduced movement by IDs. They introduced the one network area where we could roam. You could call from Kenya to Uganda without additional charges, which made trade suddenly open up, which made people suddenly realize integration works. Until we had the president do that, I must say it would have taken us 20 years perhaps to do what we have been able to do in the last few years. So we cannot underestimate the power of individuals and the power of champions, be they political or technical uh, uh, champions. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Very valid point indeed, the champions. Bruce? Yeah, I'm, uh, well, I'm, I'm happy to come in and also pick up a couple of the questions that were in the, in the, in the, from, the, from the audience. And I think Alan actually started to answer or has in a way answered one of the questions from Alan Hirsch asking about sort of what are the, the institutions or the informal structures which are actually allowing policymakers and officials to work through some of these sort of the hurdles. So, I mean, I would be actually very interested, Alan, to build on what you've just said to say, so do you know, I mean, you mentioned is it about leaving legacies or what, but what drove the coalition of the willing? Um, I mean, is, can we pick into that? And actually another sort of thought that I had is, as you were talking, since we were saying in West Africa, there was a challenge of working with UMOA and ECOWAS. I mean, you're actually in East Africa working with the EAC and COMESA. They're all, they're all members there and even EGAD. So, I mean, I think you're, well, maybe that's just a, a question. Your TMEA's relationship with the RECs, I mean, you mentioned that so you're working with their programs, but how does it work with multiple RECs? Or are you sort of somehow managing to be at an arm's distance, which somehow creates a different dynamic? Because it seems, I mean, maybe, maybe that then takes us to, so, to Michael. Um, I mean, what you said actually about doing PEA actually led to the structure that you have. So I just, actually, I hadn't thought of that at all. And when, when you were speaking, I actually wondered, is there a sense, and maybe this goes to Wumi as well, a sense of actually sometimes it's better to try and maintain a kind of a, a technical of almost neutral stance by being technical, although this is all political. Uh, I mean, maybe that also sort of speaks a bit to the point that was made before about doing PA studies is fine, but sometimes they can cause problems. So does that mean there's a need to be arm's length and you, these should only be done outside and, and, and maybe there's, a, there's a, a, a need to sort of actually try and be technical while taking account of the political dynamics? And then, I mean, so now I'm just being a, an extra chair here, but <laughs> for, for women, I was also just wondering, you said, and I think it's a great point, it's very important who does this kind of analysis. 
And I think we are sort of certainly sensitive to, to that. But then the question goes, so does ECOWAS do those kind of analysis? So are you aware that these kind of things happen or it's more sort of playing out naturally on the ground? I mean, or maybe what would be more interesting for ECOWAS would be more a political economy analysis of the donors who are engaging in the region and why they're engaging and what their sort of challenges are, because that's also, also what, uh, what, what Alan just mentioned. And I think maybe there's one question actually that's also in here um, talking about, it's almost sort of comparing a bit TMEA and TFWA. Um, is it possible that TMEA sees integration in an oversimplified approach while TFWA gives the impression of it being an overcomplicated relationship? Is this because of this ECOWAS UMOA dualism? So I guess it's back to the sort of the regional bodies, but also then introducing another layer um, about working with corridor management authorities. So that we're just adding <laughs> adding some more elements into, into the pile there for but this is, I mean, it's fascinating so far. And maybe if I can add something then from my own side. I mean, we've been in our work saying we need to move from this working, I mean, thinking politically, so doing our analysis, into the, the working part. And what we had come up with as 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 as, as ECDPM, but a bit less having these kind of conversations was from a donor perspective or even from a, a regional perspective, one point seems to be, can you actually do anything to alter what's taking place? So if we took sort of Wumi, your, your pessimistic and, and optimistic countries, can you actually alter the incentives there? Is there something that you could do? And, and Alan's point seemed to be that maybe you can buy sort of either their own sort of incentives or by sort of maybe providing information which shows, I've heard, for example, showing that more efficient borders actually produce more revenue then in fact, in a way, you're altering incentives there. But maybe in some cases, maybe you can't alter the incentives, but the DRC joining and the conflicts there, maybe there's nothing you can do. So then it's kind of, can you therefore adapt? And is it a way of actually still achieving the objectives that you want by adapting? If not, and, and Alan mentioned actually awaiting, that's our third day, saying politically it wasn't the moment in Tanzania, but maybe actually that's changing. And then, I mean, can we have, do we need to avoid certain actors and get there, or are there certain things we need to abandon? I think all of those kind of come back to these questions of how flexible can you actually be? Uh, and I guess it's a bit worrying what you say is that there seems to almost be a, a step back in terms of flexibility uh, from the donors and, and a sense of wanting to have more control again, which kind of seems, at least from my understanding, to undermine a little bit some of these objectives. Sorry, that's maybe a bit too much, but that's sort of throwing in some more elements and, and some questions as well. Thanks, Bruce, indeed. A whole set of questions, but indeed integrating also the questions from the floor. Any of you feel comfortable to, to start? I can start because a few were thrown at me and at us. It's very challenging. I think the biggest question, the biggest thing that has been said to me over the last six, eight months is, well, you think you know it all, but you don't know West Africa. It's a different ball game. <laughs> And that has been said time and time again as we go to West Africa. So when we started the work in West Africa in September last year, we had we signed a memorandum with the FCFTA to do support uh, as a technical partner for the CFTA. We were told by the ministers, well, you think you know it, we do appreciate what you've done in East Africa. We do know, but you must appreciate our context is different. You must understand what's on the ground. So since then, I think personally myself and my team, we've had over six missions or more including driving across the, from Abidjan to West Africa, to, to Lagos. That was a very interesting one, just understanding the dynamics. Of course, we had to get note verbals from the presidents because the borders were closed. But it was so interesting just being on the ground and seeing the dynamics. And in the end, we realized, yes, a lot may be different, but a lot is also the same. We also recognize that so much work has been done that perhaps people are beating themselves so much in the West. There's a lot on the ground that has been done. I mean, if you look at the joint border posts that have been established, huge infrastructure that is in place that has already the workings. And even in terms of the road network, a lot has been done. What I have seen, which has been quite interesting, in the first months we were met with a lot of suspicion. Yes, people knew we had done a lot, but they thought, can you do it in West Africa? We, we know, we have come and toured your projects in East Africa. Yes, it's so good. But as Mayoke says, maybe this can't work. You know, in East Africa, you will move with one, your consignment on one single uh, form from the port of Mombasa to Kigali. You don't have to enter into the custom system another another uh, um, 
whatever, another form. Well, let me use the word form. But in West Africa, you're going to have five transactions from the time you leave Abidjan to the time you get to Lagos. So they were so skeptical. But I must say that after engaging and seeing how we really go into the ground and understand issues and just listen, 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 we are starting to see people now buying in and warming to us and really engaging with us and coming to talk to us. And that's why I talked about building trust. But of course, now everyone wants to say, okay, what's the first thing you're going to do? What's the first thing that's going to open up doors? What's the first thing that will actually make it work? Because everyone is tired about seeing what's happening and goods not moving and borders having challenges and this and that. But as I keep saying, so much has been done by the likes of uh, TF, uh, that Trade Facilitation West Africa program and others. But perhaps we are not seeing that there's already this stuff is there and that we can uh, see how we build upon. So that's the first thing. I've seen the shift from skepticism to optimism, but now to say, okay, we want to see something. You know, the second thing you talked about, why did it work in the coalition? What brought the coalition together? It was, I mean, for a lot of those guys there, it was the president of Uganda, of Kenya, of Rwanda. Maybe it was legacy, but there was also the whole issue of survival. These are small countries, some of them, and the recognition that we must do together. So the revenue incentive was very big. Just those customs reform, what they immediately do is that customs governments start seeing a huge revenue inflow because of the efficiencies. And that for us has driven and shifted uh, dynamics in many cases. So it's an incentive in a way, you're adapting and shifting the incentives to get them to, to buy into this. Uh, and so a lot of that was both survival, legacy, but also just within their national governments, I think wanting to prove that this thing we have been doing for a long time can work. And again, there's the whole thing of the stars aligning. It aligned for us in that moment in 2013. And we were fortunate, we, were, we rode on that wave and we were able to, be, they found us ready. We had our technical solutions and they were able to drive. And so that has helped uh, a lot. Definitely as the CFTA becomes more real, there's going to be a lot of, you know, when you put Irish potatoes in a pot to boil, they start, you know, jostling. There's going to be a lot of jostling between the RECs and the CFTA. But I think if we can all bring people to the table to see it is for the common good, it's for Africans. And someone has talked about citizens. Can you imagine if we traded together? I mean, I, I'm right now in Brussels. I drove from Amsterdam to Brussels because the planes had been canceled. I didn't see any border, nothing. I drove through and I, I woke up and said, oh, have we reached the border? And they said, no, we, we, we passed, there's no border. Can you imagine that for Africa? Because the people are the same. It's one people. You go to borders in West Africa, the people are speaking the same language. East Africa, same language on either side of Kenya and Uganda. So then you're asking what, if, if we all recognize the REC, CFTA, whoever, national, that this is for our good, but it's that realization mm -hmm. coming to bear. How do we make that happen? Over to you. Thank you, Alan, indeed. Um, lots of positive stories actually also and, and progress made in, in West Africa. I do think, I mean, when you're seeing the smaller countries, and in fact, that was linked to the question also in East Africa, as compared to West Africa, of course, with much, many more, and you have the, not to mention the name of the country, but big countries there um, that might feel much less of a need to indeed work together. So there are clearly differences, but there's also a lot of similarities. Maybe Michael or Dr. Rumi, you still have also some of the points that um, Bruce brought up before in terms yes. of the layers. Thank you very much. Let me just take uh, two minutes. Uh, you see, with my at least many, like 12, 13 years with ECOWAS now, I can I tell you that uh, there's a proper management of relationship among these three core organizations within the ECOWAS, given all those uh, factors I related before. But there's one thing I want you to know. Regional integration is too expensive, very, very expensive, and very slow process in reaching an agreement. And uh, I wish you can be able to know how much was spent on the negotiation of ECOWAS EPA. And at the end of the day, we can be able to see we are still with negotiations still continue. And you see some country now implementing interim EPA within the region which is somewhat challenging to our custom union. And that is what I want Bruce to understand. 
please, there are many technical issues. There are many non-technical issues within the issue of regional integration. And I can authoritatively say it. I don't think there's any external consultant that can work on any of those things that will understand the intricacies or the political dimension to what is happening. That's why I'm really recommending if you want to embark on this kind of uh, political economic analysis, there's a need to work with research department in each of the regional economic community so that in form of collaboration, and uh, so that what cannot be known to an outsider can be known with somebody within. And there's a need to strengthen that kind of uh, department dealing with that. Why am I saying that? You see, let me give you a typical example. Maybe the challenge of Nigeria reluctancy to accept the EPA was timing. If you look at that 2015 was an election year in the country. And no country will sign any kind of agreement like that when it's looking for vote from people. And we're able to see the government of the day is on the leadering on the issues and so on and so on. And that's what we have been dealing with today. And you can be able to see what happened the president of the country is about going to Kigali to sign the agreement to AFCFT. But there are some political forces from somewhere, especially from private sector. Private sectors of country are stronger compared to others. There's a need to be able to understand what, what Allen said the other time. What, what's their incentives? How can you make them to buy into idea? And I think this is what I think all the external donors really need to focus on. What are the political contests of any kind of intervention you want to do at any regional economic community? When you can be able to study that, you can be able to now to program it into that kind of intervention. Because what I say as a major challenge is the sustainability of many of these interventions. You will see immediately there's a hand to no fund that marks the end of that kind of program. For that program to continue, it becomes difficult. Because maybe that program is not a priority of the mm -hmm. region. So we must be able to build an element of sustainability, not only from the regs, but also from the government and also from the private sector. If we can be able to see how we can be able to buy, put the idea and provide mm -hmm. some kind of basic understanding of any kind of program, especially to the private sector, we may not be able to have a lot of, that's me, I don't see political will as a problem. To me, I don't see political problem as a problem. If there's a due communication, if there's a due communication, if everybody can be on board and you'll be able to let them understand the idea, you'll be able to see countries implement it. And a typical example is our free movement program. You will see okay. the free movement program of ECOWAS is working. Please, let's find a way to study the political economy of free movement of person. You'll be able to see that political will is not a problem. Thank you. We we, we, we've heard this, so Alina, we have a next thinking and working political session on that specific program and have enough time indeed. It's such a pity. I think this has been really already a very rich uh, discussion and there's so many things I would uh, want to go into, but, and I hear you very well in terms of the opportunity cost of, for example, the IPA negotiations and the few people working on trade. Was that the best investment in it or were there other things that they, should have been investing on. But um, maybe Michael, because I want to give you, I realize we're almost at the end and I want to give you the floor also on many of these different things. Is there any of them you want to pick up that you feel um, you would like to contribute still? Yeah, maybe just a very briefly. Thank you so much, first of all, for the uh, very interesting conversation. Um, and um, I Again, uh, you know, resonate very well with uh, you know what has been said by Dr. Wumi and, and Alan. So thank you very much for this lively conversation. So I'm so what I'm taking away is really I mean there are so many different forces right that for us to make things happen on the ground so that there is a reform. Um, and that reform is actually impacting positively the citizens uh, that was mentioned, uh, the word citizen was mentioned in the chat. And uh, it's, it's almost like we are in the constant search of that opportunity. Um, and uh, the program needs to be done in such a way to be opportunistic. And I, I don't want to sound 
negative about it. And I, I want to put it in the light of this uh, the emphasis on flexibility and an adaptive approach. Um, but I mean, it, it, it's again, it, it's about the, the, the aligning the stars, as Alan was saying. And aligning the star purposefully is going to be a massive challenge. And uh, Bruce, you were saying, okay, what can we do to, to make the, the conducive environment? But you know, I think star, star alignment is almost like something that when the, pre, the opportunity presents itself, we need to grab it, right? And then that opportunity will probably change depending on the topics, depending on the circumstances. We put a lot of emphasis on politicians, but there are certain topics which doesn't require politicians. It's the technical level discussions or with technicians within the government, but there has to be somebody mentioned about the informal dialogue. There has to be an informal dialogue across the country to so that there is a coalition of willingness over the technicians, not the politicians, right? So depending on the topics, we need to peel the layers and then understand the topics. So, you know, coming back to the PEA analysis, uh, I, again, I stand by the importance of it. And then to me, for uh, somebody who implements the, the program, the, the more specific on the topics and subject, the better, because it allows us to really understand the prioritization of the political economy analysis and the recommendations coming out of it. So that will be my last thought, Kathleen. I'll stop here. Thank, thank you very much. In fact, the reality is you only have three minutes, so there's no way I can summarize this um, this this incredibly fascinating, I thought, uh, an interesting discussion. But uh, I hear you being ready to ride the wave when there's the right momentum and making sure it's an inclusive dialogue indeed with the many different partners. Bruce, I know nobody can summarize as well as you. Do you want to have a final word? <laughs> we can't hear you. Yeah, usual. I thought we'd learned how to unmute ourselves. No, I, I mean, I, I yeah, I, I've been sort of trying to boil down everything that's been said here, but I, th I think, as you've said, we need to, to, to pick up some of these themes and take them forward. But I've got five sort of takeaways that I pull out from all of this. The first should be uh, music to the ears of Alina, I think, and the TWP folks, is that there have been various things about they need to ride the wave, they need to dance with the system, they need to be opportunistic. And the thing about stars aligning, there's an element of luck. And I think that as a kind of contextualizing all of these engagements is, is already a, a sort of a key sort of message, I think, when we're, when we're thinking of these things. It also struck me, I mean, obviously, uh, Alan was quite explicit about that, but I think it also came out in the other uh, interventions about trust. Um, and I think trust being important, the coalition of the willing, I see, was an element of sort of political trust emerging at a specific time. Um, I also hear sort of the need to listen and engage and get beyond sort of what the, what the superficial story might be. Um, but also on that trust side, the sort of the risk that that doing sort of this sort of public PEA can undermine trust actually, and I think that then kind of suggests this this need for finding a balance about who does that kind of work, how it's done, and I, I mean I know about PEA studies that have been that have been uh, commissioned where they, they want to keep it under the radar, keep it secret. I'm not sure if that's necessarily the the answer. Uh, and maybe it's more to do with sort of who's doing it and, and how it's put in the public. So it's not about a spying exercise, but something that hopefully is about identifying these opportunities more explicitly. And, and But this, the, I think this trust element definitely is there. And for regional integration in general, I think the, the, the trust story is there. And I think maybe, the, maybe this part, sort of the third point then would be that maybe tensions are normal and should be expected. Uh, maybe it's just a pipe dream to imagine that because there are agreements that have been made, that somehow this, this should easily therefore flow because the politicians agreed. Uh, maybe the response should more be, no, this, it will and always will be complicated. There are and always are opportunity costs. That it's expensive, as Wumi said. It will, take, uh, it will take patience. But I think within that, I think there was something interesting I found was this sort of this combination of technical and political. And, and the possibility that sort of, in a way it's about transparency and information may help alter certain positions 
whether at a technical level where it's sort of bottom up and, and sort of bureaucrats or agents at borders or if we're talking about politicians tied up. I mean, the fourth point then I think still sort of running through of all of this was this point of the need to try and somehow be problem driven, like what is actually the problem being discussed? Um, I mean, we even actually, somebody mentioned just now the role of the private sector and how the private sector can be an incredibly strong force for good or bad in terms of blocking or not. The, and we did this work in Mozambique, looking at the two corridors, where in fact the, the relations between the private sector and the state basically played out very differently. So this idea that in fact, if you can better understand what the problem is, and then it comes back to these sort of incentives around there and, and, and maybe sort of meeting this political supply of, 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 of agreements and things with this private sector demand. So the, the final point then I think would be overall messages for this thinking and working politically more generally is, is it, it can help, but there's a need for, for balance, uh, that we need to kind of balance all of these other four elements that I've mentioned about internal, external, public or, or less public, who does it? Um, but I think overall, I think my key takeaway is, that, is, is this sort of sense that everybody has of the needs to kind of have flexibility built in um, and then the challenge is to, to somehow sort of make that, that a reality. So from my side, at least, I would thank everybody. It was a super rich uh, conversation. So thanks, everybody. And I hope to, we can follow on the conversation. Can I just finish by saying that Bruce is going to be writing about this. So please watch this space. Um, and <laughs> that, you will, you will see all of what he writing. has said <laughs> so well and so he has put so eloquently on paper at some point, not too far in the future, I hope. So thanks. Thank, Thank you, you to all the panelists. All the best. Bye. And thanks, thanks to the participants for listening and your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks a lot, everybody. Bye bye. Thanks.